Ladies and gentlemen, uh, your excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, uh, welcome to the DCU Brexit Institute. Uh, my name is Federico Fabrini. Uh, I am a full professor of EU law and the founding director of the Institute. Uh, and it is my great pleasure to open this high level event on Brexit and European foreign policy. Uh, as you know, uh, this initiative could hardly be uh, more timing. Uh, last Sunday, May 1st, the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement formally entered into force following ratification of the European Parliament. Today, uh, voters in Scotland, Wales, and many parts of England are going to the polls in an election uh, which will shape the future of the UK. And Sunday, on May 9th, Europe's Day, uh, the European Union will eventually launch the Conference on the Future of Europe, uh, which is designed to shape the future of integration for years to come. So within this, the flux of this event, uh, today's webinar, which is the ninth uh, organized by the Brexit Institute uh, in the current uh, academic year, seeks to continue to fulfill our mission to document and debate the multifaceted consequences of an historical event uh, such as Brexit. In particular, this high-level panel is focused on the implications of Brexit for a policy domain, that of foreign affairs, uh, which is significantly impacted also by developments in transatlantic relations. Uh, as such, the aim of our event is to reflect on what Brexit means for the future of both the EU's and the UK's external action in the field of diplomacy and defense, including enlargement, cooperation with NATO, and partnership uh, with the United States. Uh, to discuss these hot issues, we're really fortunate to feature a stellar cast of speakers and experts uh, from the world of academia uh, and practice, namely uh, Javier Solana, former U U EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs, uh, Marta Dassou, former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy, Kim Darroch, former UK Ambassador to the United States, Eric Jones, professors at John Hopkins and soon at the European University Institute, and Gesim Vizoka, Associate Professor at DCU, uh, who will be moderated by no one else than Stephen Erlanger uh, from the New York Times. Uh, I will shortly hand over the floor to, uh, to Stephen, uh, who will introduce all the speakers in greater detail, but allow me to warmly thank, on behalf of Dublin City University and the Brexit Institute, Javier, Marta, Kim, Eric, and indeed uh, Stephen for accepting to join us this morning. Uh, moreover, it is my duty uh, as the director to, as ever, thank the sponsor of the Brexit Institute, AIB, Grant Thornton, and GSK Stockman, uh, who through their support are enabling our research uh, and policy work. Uh, the Brexit Institute is also very proud to acknowledge funding uh, from the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, as well as by the European Union under the Erasmus Plus program uh, for a Jean Monnet network called uh, Breach. Uh, lastly, allow me to thank you all, uh, the audience, for joining us. Uh, despite the Zoom fatigue, uh, it's nice to see that there are 60, almost 60 attendees uh, in the audience. And just as a housekeeping rule, uh, let me remind everyone that we are recording uh, this uh, event and that later there will be also space for uh, questions, either through the chat function or uh, by a request to speak uh, and be unmuted. But Stephen uh, will, uh, or Chair, uh, will uh, give you further information and therefore Without further ado, I'll hand him straight the floor. Once again, thanks to everyone for uh, joining and uh, joining us today. Stephen, the floor is yours. Federico, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome to all who are interested in this. Uh, Federico is right, we have a great panel. I won't reintroduce everyone since um, you did it very efficiently. Uh, this is an odd day. Uh, we're talking about the EU Brexit and foreign policy. It's, it's a day when Michel Barnier, the, the French negotiator for the EU, has published his diaries, his, uh, which seem to be partly his campaign proposals for the French presidency about how difficult he found uh, the Brexit talks. But it's also a day where the more excitable parts of the British and French media think they want to go to war over fish and the island of island of island of Jersey. So um, you can tell these are issues that are raw, they're to the surface, they're not finished yet, and they do have implications for um, the rest of all of us. So 
I do want to thank you all for your patience. The one thing I would say is if when you, you know, we've gone through the panel, you want to ask questions, please just use the Q&A function. Um, I think it'll be simpler and probably more time efficient. And I'd like to get in as many questions and responses as we possibly can. So it is my true pleasure. Um, there are a lot of friends on, on this panel to ask Marta Dasu to start. Uh, Marta runs the Aspen Institute of Italy. She's a former defense, a deputy foreign minister of, of um, Italy and um, has been one of the great interlocutors, I think, on these issues for, um, for really many years and is a dear friend. So Marta, over to you, please. Thanks a lot, Stephen, and thanks to Federico and to your institute, the Brexit Institute, for, for this invitation. I didn't read the Barnier book for the moment being. The title is already quite revealing, uh, The Great Illusion, if I'm right. So certainly the, this is already a sort of criticism of Brexit we will uh, discuss later on. I have to say yesterday, there was an important agreement in my view reached between Dominic, Dominic Raab and Joseph Borrell on the status of the EU delegation in London, uh, which will be consistent uh, with ambassadors from nation state. It is partially a symbolic move and yet it is important because that shows that both parties are ready to to overcome a sort of corrosive and useless dispute, uh, largely uh, ideological, I would say, on, on the British side, and possibly uh, pragmatic cooperation on foreign policy is about to, to start. And I would like to, to make three points uh, on, this pot, on this topic, uh, mostly uh, from the EU perspective. Uh, the first point, and let me state this plainly, Brexit, has further weakened the US foreign policy and security policy in whatever way uh, we look at the issue. Uh, the EU lost one of the most ca capable European power. In other policy areas of the EU, it can be argued that the presence of the UK acted as a sort of break on some forms of further integration a major case in point is the next generation EU package, uh, which would have been hard to imagine in its current form uh, with London at the table. However, in my view, in security and defense, the situation is totally different. The EU's weakness as a diplomatic actor is a consequence of internal divisions and Brexit is only making the situation worse. On PESCO and European Defence Fund, the Structured Cooperation on Foreign Policy and the European Defence Fund, this judgment becomes perhaps a bit more nuanced. These are two areas where, at least in principle, the absence of the UK might facilitate deeper European cooperation. But on the industrial side, it is clear that losing uh, the, British uh, the British contribution is a serious loss. And so overall, I believe that the geopolitical impact of, of Brexit on the EU is negative, particularly in terms of maritime projection in the Atlantic area. And the center of gravity of the EU has shifted as a consequence of Brexit towards France and Germany, and to some extent uh, towards Italy, but it remains very difficult to, to articulate a shared foreign policy vision. Uh, let's, uh, let's make the case of Libya, for instance, with all the differences between Italy and France. As a member state, uh, the UK was often able to play a sort of balancing role uh, between the ambitions of France and the inhibitions uh, of Germany. This is a point uh, well taken by Stephen Lenn uh, in, a, in a recent paper for, for, for Carnegie. And so building a new balance uh, will not be easy as differences over the so-called strategic autonomy make already uh, clear. In my view, the European credibility on foreign, on foreign policy and security is already 
at a lowest ebb, uh, the euro is consumed by the fight against COVID-19, largely introverted, challenged by, by Russia, uh, by Turkey and Libya. And so the, the EU seems very far from the rhetorical objective of building up a geopolitical uh, projection. In short, I see negative consequences for European foreign policy. We lost the UK capacity in this field, while our shortcomings will not certainly be solved uh, by the UK's uh, departure. My second point is that the following one is this premise is true. The EU has a precise interest in winning back the UK in foreign policy and defense. Uh, for the bottom being, as we all know, Johnson government has shown no interest in cooperation with the EU, preferring to leave foreign and security policy outside the cooperation agreement with the EU of last December, by the way, that was ratified uh, very recently by the European Parliament. Uh, however, my view is that the UK and EU interests in the Euro-Atlantic region largely co coincide. So once a spirit of recognition is overcome, and I repeat yesterday again, Marx, my view of potential shift, common interests uh, will prevail. The EU has three forms of leverage. Uh, first, the EU toolbox. Uh, in order to reach its security objectives in the Euro-Atlantic region, uh, which remains according to the integrated review uh, the home region, uh, notwithstanding the tilt uh, to Asia Pacific, the UK cannot discard the relevance of the UK toolbox in foreign policy and security. Sanctions are a case in point. But the same is true for the fight against terrorism, against money laundering, the fight against external interference in European democratic societies. In a nutshell, in front of Russia, uh, which remains the key security risk, according to the integrated review, both the UK and the EU need to consult and cooperate. Second, and very problematic leverage, the British government needs positive engagement with the EU to keep the United Kingdom together. together. This is true in particular for the future of Scotland, Federico already told us that the elections are, are there today, the EU must avoid becoming embroiled in national tensions within the, the UK, but certainly the, the problem of the EU is, is a problem in, in, in national tensions uh, within uh, the UK, which makes uh, for some leverage, but also for, for delicate problems for the EU itself. And for the US, a uh, factor, we, we all know that Biden administration, contrary to Trump, seems clear about appreciating the value of partnership with the, with the EU. And uh, uh, I don't know, we don't know the details of the meetings on the fringes of the G7 uh, yesterday, but uh, I think that it can be uh, that Tony Blinken may have encouraged the compromise over the EU delegation status. And the British side need to recognize that with Biden at the White House, there is no choice to make uh, we, uh, between Washington and Brussels. And the risk uh, for the UK is to be marginalized uh, from key US EU decisions at the crossroad uh, between economy and geopolitics. Clearly, the British effort is to move such discussions on technology and security, for instance, to the G7 table. And still, the direct relations between the US and the EU are going to carry most of the weight, especially if the proposal of setting up a trade and technology council uh, goes, uh, goes yeah. up. And so uh, I see some risk for the UK of cutting itself out uh, from cooperation with the EU. And, and finally, third point, uh, there will be two tendencies at work. I can, I can go back on, on this point. Uh, the UK will try a, a NATO first policy. Uh, in my view, uh, this will not be enough. 
given that the EU-NATO relations are becoming more important, especially on the southern on the southern front, on the southern flank. Another possibility is that NATO first be combined with the E3 format uh, born from negotiation on Iran. This is a very realistic possibility. Bilateral defense agreements uh, will remain part of the European defense industry, especially in Italy, Leonardo, uh, with its presence on the British market, could, could even see a benefit in Brexit, given the important increase of the UK military spending. But there are limits, in my view, to the potential of the E3 scheme. I, I can go back to, to this point later on. My final conclusion is that the EU can and must offer the UK the possibility of discussing a comprehensive deal, going back to the 19 political declaration on foreign policy and security. But this would imply granting the UK a higher degree of access than other uh, third parties. So it will be, it has to be, in my view, a bespoken agreement, uh, granting enhanced cooperation on internal and external security, including easier access to the EDF, to the European Defense Fund. Thanks. Marta, thank you so, so much for very elegantly laying the table for all of us. Um, I'm, I'm very struck today that um, the first PESCO program open to third countries was approved or, or will be approved by EU defense ministers. So this, I hope, you know, it will make the UK perhaps feel a bit better, certainly make the Americans, Canadians, Norwegians and others feel a bit better too. Um, but um, there's a long way to go. I mean, this, this divorce feels pretty bitter. Anyway, we will now proceed um, to um, Kim Derrick, who is, has been one of Britain's great diplomats. I first met him when he was ambassador to the EU. He, he was a real ambassador. He wasn't <laughs> treated in any different way. Um, and then he was national security advisor to the British government and a very effective one and then went to Washington as a, a very fine ambassador where he basically was trapped by an un, a terrible leak um, of private papers um, and, and understood in the Trump administration that his position had become untenable and so very graciously stepped aside. But he remains one of the great thinkers and voices um, and Kim, over to you. Stephen, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and thank you to the organizers, um, Fabio and his team of, of this event. It's a great uh, honor to appear amongst these panelists. And I have to say one word, it's wonderful to see Javier Solana again. Um, throughout my career, which was 15 years uh, on European Union policy, um, uh, he was, uh, and remains, of course, a huge figure in Europe, um, both as Secretary General of NATO and as High Representative. And it's great to see him looking so well. I look forward to hearing him in, in a little while. I'll use my five minutes very briefly to cover three subjects. How I think Brexit will impact on European foreign policy. A few words, since it's my old my old specialization the, on, the, on the transatlantic relationship with Joe Biden now in the White House. And finally, a few words about the country I know best, my own, how I think our future relationship with the EU will evolve. But let me start with the impact of Brexit on EU foreign policy. As I've said, I spent around 15 years of my career specializing in the EU. Quite a lot of that time was spent sitting around a table with the representatives of the other member states. And quite a lot of the time around that table was dealing with EU external policy, whether enlargement or trade policy or CFSP, Common Foreign Security Policy. And uh, in my time doing this, which of course all preceded Brexit, which happened while I was in Washington, um, inside the Foreign Office and actually across the British government, we took uh, external policy and particularly CFSP very seriously. 
we saw it as a good thing. Uh, there were, of course, frustrations with some of the outcomes feeling like the lowest common denominator, but we saw it as a multiplier for our own foreign policy positions and objectives, provided, of course, we could win the argument around the EU table. So it became quite a dominant priority in, uh, in, in foreign policy. Uh, and the other point here about, about, uh, about EU external policy is that it's a form of self-protection. If you're going to criticize another country over its human rights record or its actions towards its neighbors or some other aspect of its behavior, or go further and impose sanctions on them, there is real value, of course, in being part of a larger group. Your action has more impact, and if there's going to be retaliation, you're less likely to be singled out. So there is a sort of protection in numbers in EU external policy, um, and it made, I believe, the UK a more powerful, influential player on the international scene. All of which leads to the conclusion that we are significantly weakened as a foreign policy force by being outside the EU. You might think that is obvious, but actually uh, it's a contested point in the UK debate, with the counter argument being that we now have much more freedom to do exactly what we want, rather than, if re rather than reflect some common denominator EU compromise. On which what I would say is, yes, we have more freedom, but because we are alone, we are much more vulnerable to marginalization and to retaliation. And our actions, when we take them, have less impact. So overall, I am concerned that we carry less weight. We certainly carry less weight in Washington, where a lot of that UK-US channel was about European issues and European positions on international uh, trouble spots. Uh, small and nimble, which is the, the rallying call of, um, of Brexit supporters, may work well with vaccination programs, but it is less valid when it comes to influencing China or standing up to Russia. Um, I also think uh, that EU foreign policy is weakened by our departure. We weren't big players on every issue in Brussels, on the Euro, for example, but on foreign policy, the thing was that agree with us or not, we had views on everything. And with the second largest armed forces in NATO, we had some hardware to back up our positions. And our absence must, I think, have taken something of value away from the EU table to which we genuinely brought something and made a difference to outcomes. Just a few words on the transatlantic relationship. Um, I don't think it will surprise anyone if I say that it is good for Europe that Joe Biden is now president rather than a second term Donald Trump. Uh, Biden is not going to say that NATO is a scam by the Europeans designed to get America to pay for their defense. He's not going to try to buy Greenland. Um, he's not going to say that the EU is worse than China. He believes in multilateralism and the rules-based international order. He's taken the US back into the Paris Climate Change Agreement and the World Health Organization he is recommitted to NATO, and he would like, under certain conditions, to rejoin the Iran nuclear deal. But here's my point. This doesn't mean, I would argue, that everything will be plain sailing, will be straightforward over the next four years. I think Biden will continue to press the Europeans to spend more on defense. I think he will press Europe, the EU, and the UK separately to, to be tough on Russia. I don't think, for example, the Democrats in the White House are any keener on Russian pipelines into Europe than the Republicans were. And third point, I observed during my time in Washington that there is something approaching a national consensus uh, across the American national security community about China, a consensus that China is the strategic challenge for the US for this century. What Biden will do, which Trump didn't, is try to multilateralize US policy. In other words, he will look for strong European support when he confronts China over their trade policies or their aggression in the South China Sea or their human rights abuses. We know the Biden team were unhappy with the investment agreement that the EU signed with China just before Biden took office. And there will be a lot more of this friction and this pressure, I think. I'll close with just a few words on the UK and Europe. 
Um, it wouldn't surprise anyone that I personally wasn't a big fan of Brexit, but it's done in arguably the hardest form it could have been done short of no deal, and there is no going back. So what now? I think we're currently at a low point in UK-EU uh, relations. I think there is a lot to criticise in the deal on future relations that we sealed with the EU just before Christmas. Our negotiators prioritised a sort of mythical sovereignty, uh, a perfect sovereignty, rather than a pragmatic deal which preserved, so far as possible, established trade channels, established met methods of cooperation. But we are where we are. I have to say the vaccine wars have made the situation worse. I won't get into the rights and wrongs of what's happened. There are strongly held views on both sides of the channel, but it has shifted the debate in the UK, it has shifted public opinion in the UK, and it's made it harder to be uh, pro-EU in this country. Um, that said, my final point of promise, I think time will heal these wounds. I believe that ultimately common sense will prevail. On our trading difficulties, I think we'll try to reach a series of individual deals, sector by sector. It'll be tiresome to negotiate, but it will, in the longer term, uh, provide the foundations for the sort of comprehensive agreement on some form of special relationship with the EU that Marta uh, flagged in her intervention. Uh, and on which I strongly agree with her. It may not be till after our next general election in 2024, but I'm confident it will happen. As for foreign policy, I think pragmatism on both sides will ultimately see us, not quickly, but over the next few years to a more sensible solution and currently appears likely, uh, just because it doesn't make any sense for the EU and the UK not to cooperate on external policy, on foreign policy. Both sides, though the UK more than the EU, are weakened by not doing so. Whether this means new structures, I don't know. The EU is great at developing new structures, but I think it will happen. Uh, on which point I will shut up and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Great, Kim. Kim, thank you very, very much. Um, I must say, I fear, well, I think it will take a new British government um, before relations with the EU come back to any kind of a quiet, friend, friendly space. But I did want to ask you just quickly, knowing the diplomatic world, I mean, what did do you think the British government think it was going to accomplish by downgrading EU representation in London quickly? Was it just a blow across the face or, 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 um, how did you interpret it? Obviously, it's now finished, I guess. Yeah. Um, two quick points. Um, on your first point, um, Stephen, just very briefly, you could be right. We could have to await a new, a new British government for things to get to a more pragmatic and rational place. I have friends who are, I mean, you can guess which wing of the Conservative Party they are on, who think it will come uh, in the second half of Boris Johnson's Prime Ministership, if he survives wallpaper and um, uh, all that stuff. Um, uh, because it's true that, that, you know, part of Boris is a sort of one nation conservative, one nation Tory, and the other part is a sort of populist, and the two parts fight for one another. But there are people who, who have links into number 10 who tell me that that shift is coming. We will see. Um, you know, you hear these things and you take them with a very large pinch of salt, but we will see. Um, look to the next reshuffle, Stephen, which is supposedly in May, uh, so later this month, but I think he may postpone it because I think he hates, he hates doing these things and the confrontation that it can sometimes involve. But if he brings some Remainers into the cabinet, that might be the first indicator. On your question about, about diplomatic space, look, this was just, I think, a really clumsy and I could say this slightly dumb thing to do, and we've now backed down. Um, I think it was uh, a little signal, which the government does um, from time to time, to the hardline Brexit wing of the parliamentary party and their supporters out in the country, that they're continuing to be, to stand up to the EU and be tough with them. Um, I just think it was a mistake and uh, uh, no, it's never going to last. Um, and, uh, you know, they've had to back down. They've managed to do it 
Um, at the time, there's lots of other news around, so it's not necessarily on the front pages. Um, but we should never have done it, and I'm glad it's been sorted. But well, it was sort of strange. Was a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just sort of strange, just because Trump tried it too and backed down. Yeah. You, you would have under. A anyway, I mean, let's move on. Um, we can always come back to the British psychology. Um, <laughs> Yes. We move on. Eric Jones is a very distinguished scholar of, of Europe, of the transatlantic relationship. He's professor of European studies and international political economy at, at um, Johns Hopkins and is soon, I guess, to move to Europe to um, take over quite an um, enviable position, which he can explain. But Eric, over to you, please. Stephen, thank you, and, and thank you for letting me go after after Marta and Kim. Like any good uh, academic, I like to follow the journalists, diplomats, and politicians because then I can repeat what they said, replacing all the details with a theoretical framework. Uh, and, and the theoretical points I want to make are, are really four. They're about trust, about interdependence, about autonomy, and about effectiveness. Uh, and I think if you if you listen carefully to what Marta and, and Kim said, you come away with a strong sense of why there has been significant damage done to the trust in the relationship between Britain uh, and, and the rest of the European Union, uh, trust in the relationship between uh, Europe and the United States. I mean, you could see that in the in the whole conversation about Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, you just have to mention it and, and you can see that there's no trust on either side that this is not going to be used or abused. Uh, but, but don't just look at that. Look at the Buy American provisions that have been layered into the stimulus package in the United States. And you see a very clear sense that the transatlantic economy is not what it used to be. Uh, and, and you can imagine why the Europeans are considering Buy European provisions of their own. Look also at the tax conversation that's taking place where the Biden administration is coming out and pushing very hard for a, a basic minimum corporate tax. Uh, and, and yet somehow somewhere inside that conversation, there's a sense that, that what's gonna emerge from it is not gonna be as equitable uh, as what should go in. And I think that this loss of trust in, in these relationships is actually quite significant because it means that we lose a lot of time trying to work out ways of working together. Uh, and, and we tend to be suspicious uh, of the underlying relationships that bind economies and politics across the Atlantic. And, and that underlying relationship uh, is the interdependence. And let's face it, it's the manipulation of interdependence that has resulted in uh, this sense of mistrust. Now here I'm drawing on work by my colleague Henry Farrell uh, and Abraham Newman, where they've looked at the weaponization of interdependence. And let's not forget, it wasn't the Trump administration, but the, but the Obama administration that actually began actively to use the interdependence in the transatlantic relationship to compel European allies to follow the interests of US foreign policy. We saw that with the swift exclusion uh, of Iran and with suggestions of a swift exclusion for Russia. We saw that with the introduction of secondary sanctions uh, by the Obama administration in order to enforce its own sanctions regime. And if that was repeated uh, with gusto under the Trump administration, it doesn't mean that the loss of Trump is going to make that issue go away. So, so there is a reason for the loss of trust in, in this relationship, despite, as I think Marta pointed out quite effectively, the very deep common interests that we have in common, um, both across the Atlantic and between the United Kingdom and the United States and the European Union on either side. And so in that sense, I think, I think our interdependence uh, is going to have to be weakened, which is where, uh, moving on to my third point, this whole conversation about autonomy becomes important. Let's not forget the conversation about strategic autonomy emerged at the end of the Obama administration. It was grafted into the global uh, security strategy that the European Union uh, drafted under uh, uh, under <coughs> Federica Mogherini, uh, and, and it's only become more important in the context of the current commission. And when Marta says this commission has not emerged as a geopolitical commission in the way we might have hoped, there was a reason why we might have hoped it would become a geopolitical commission, because it should be more autonomous, and the strategic autonomy that Emmanuel Macron has been advocating should be more present. But it's very hard to achieve that autonomy without an effective actor like the United Kingdom working on your side. And certainly, if you're suspicious 
that an effective actor like the United Kingdom might work against you if the European Union goes off uh, and, and charts its foreign policy independently. And yet, and yet without that autonomy, you have to wonder how much effectiveness is Europe going to have? And this is where I move from, from the autonomy point to the effectiveness point. Uh, and here, I think we only have to imagine a couple of illustrations. Sofagate is a prime example of the loss of effectiveness. There's no way that, that the Turkish president would exploit divisions if in the European Union if those European Union divisions did not exist in the first place. Uh, I, I think the same thing is true for Russia as it's tried to exploit divisions in the European Union. And if they're trying to exploit these divisions, it's because the Trump administration identified them beforehand. Uh, and, and I think Marta is entirely right to say that Brexit has added into this sense of European division. But, but, but that sense of European division is manifest in the conversation about rule of law. It's manifest in the conversation about conditionality, either under the ESM or, or under next generation EU. It's manifest in the whole idea that Europe is going to emerge as some kind of coherent foreign policy actor, because you look at it and you can see almost immediately that the coherence doesn't exist. And this reflects back on the transatlantic relationship. The United States cannot be an effective foreign policy actor if it does not have an effective European partner. Uh, that's what we saw in Ukraine, where Tori Newland uh, made her famous expression about what to do with the EU. Uh, and, and, and yet we've seen that repeatedly time and again. And as much as the current foreign policy team under the Biden administration wants to have a multilateral opportunity, wants to have an effective world order, it's very well aware that it cannot achieve that effectiveness without a coherent European partner. So there's an enormous amount to play for that we have to fix. And the only way we can fix it is by finishing my conversation where it began. Uh, it's not enough to restore the relationships. We have to restore the trust in those relationships because that trust is what makes them predictable. And that predictability is what fosters interdependence. And that interdependence is what fosters the kind of autonomy that the West used to have as a political entity and needs to reachieve uh, in, in this much more conflictive, uh, much more challenging world system. Thank you. Um, Eric, thank you very much. I'll note that Toria Newland is back in Kiev today mm -hmm. with Tony Blinken, and I'm sure <clears throat> she would say, love the EU today. Um, but you raise a very important point about trust because obviously the Biden people are saying all the right things. But if you look at what happened with Afghanistan, some of the allies wonder whether <clears throat> the words actually have much meaning. Mm -hmm. That when, <clears throat> how many times can Joe Biden say we're back before people say back to listen, back to cooperate or back to pretend that you're leading us around by the nose, which is one of the great European questions to which we don't always have an answer, to be sure. Um, but thank you for that contribution. It's very important. And um, um, I, I will try to press Javier on some of these things. But first, um, we have Gesim Visoka, who's an associate professor of peace and conflict studies at DCU. Um, and um, um, Gezim is, is, is an expert particularly on enlargement um, and other issues. And um, I think it's really an important question because as, for example, the Americans talk about, you know, an alliance for democracies, some people might say, well, mm. why don't you look first at the state of Georgia rather than Georgia? And why don't you look perhaps first at Hungary and Poland if you're part of the EU, and shouldn't the EU be taking more seriously the idea of a Europe whole and free, or is this idea passe post-Brexit? Gizim, over to you. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks, Federico, for uh, inviting me and for uh, organizing this event. Uh, and a great pleasure to be in the company of uh, such great personalities. Arguably, uh, Brexit has impacted EU's foreign policy, as we tend to see greater fragmentation among the EU member states on a number of international issues. And, uh, and Kim and others, Martha as well, pointed that out. So in my brief uh, contribution today, I will focus on EU's enlargement policy as one of those policy areas where we can actually see the impact of Brexit 
on the EU unity of the EU member states on a particular important foreign affairs matter. So as we know, the EU's enlargement policy has been uh, one of the central pillars in managing relations with surrounding neighbors and a powerful stimulus uh, for extending democratic reforms uh, to countries who are aspiring or have a perspective to join the EU. But since its inception, the EU's uh, enlargement policy has been an experiment in the making, which has constantly changed its criteria and was driven by ever-changing internal de developments uh, and responding often to external crises. So Brexit is one of those internal developments which has had a number of significant effects on the enlargement policy. So first, I'd like to kind of briefly touch upon the impact of Brexit on the enlargement policy, but also then argue that it wasn't actually the Brexit who um, maybe deepened the fatigue of enlargement. Uh, it has to do with something more profound, which is the disagreement and disunity among the EU member states. But uh, Brexit in itself um, has consumed EU's time for four or five years uh, in the negotiation process, which has moved the attention away from the Western Balkans, uh, which has weakened its transformative power in the region and undermined the entire credibility of the, the process, the enlargement process. Second, we know for decades the UK was a great supporter of the Western Balkans' accession to the EU and has served as a vital balancer, and Kim mentioned that point as well as Martha, uh, between the competing agendas, uh, especially of Germany and France over the region. Uh, and the uh, and UK has also played a vital role in supporting conflict resolution, political and, uh, and security reforms, but also creating a joint response to emerging threats. Third, Brexit has exposed the possibility of disassociation within the EU, and as such, it has considered, consumed considerable attention uh, among EU institutions, trying to mend the existing sort of uh, cracks within its member states and structures before accepting new, uh, new members. Uh, so it has really sort of, you know, uh, brought forth the idea of rethinking whether we should really uh, open up uh, to new member states, especially with the rise of the sort of authoritarianism, authoritarianism in the Eastern Bloc, especially uh, Hungary and Poland. I think there's a greater reluctance within EU, especially sort of the Western, Northern countries, oh, if, if they should open up to the Western Balkans. And what, what would th that mean for the EU's uh, internal stability and prosperity? However, it would be misleading to only blame uh, Brexit for stalling, for example, EU's mm -hmm. enlargement process. Certainly the prospects for the EU enlargement in, of the EU in Western Balkans became grim with the arrival of Juncker's commission in 2014, which was motivated by the sort of refugee crisis and also driven by the rise of populism across Europe. So the problem has been and continues to be the nature of conditionality in the Western Balkans, which is so broad and constantly changes the targets and the scope and the lack of unity within EU member states on this sort of particular policy front. So short of any internal consensus among the EU member states, the EU enlargement policy uh, towards Western Balkans over time has actually evolved into a containment policy, which is kind of increasingly looks look, look similar to that on Turkey. And as part of this containment policy, EU continues to drag and prolong the accession process without a clear um, membership uh, perspective and timeline, which has significant implications. For example, Montenegro has opened the accession talks in 2012, but so far it's, it continues to be the front runner in, in the accession process without uh, having a clear uh, perspective uh, or a timeline for membership. Similarly, Serbia has started accession talks in 2013, uh, but uh, the progress has been slow, largely due to the rise of authoritarianism in the country, but also slow progress in the normalization of relations uh, with Kosovo. In 2019, we've seen that um, sort of EU failed to open uh, accession uh, negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania uh, due to the uh, disagreement among the EU member states, in particular France and Netherlands. And now we have Bulgari, uh, Bulgaria um, uh, added to the equation. And finally, sort of Bosnia and Kosovo are sort of not, <clears> yet, uh, have not yet opened the accession talks and are caught in different stages of the stabilization and association process. So the EU, to kind of you know, disguise that this containment policy, has come up with several half-baked initiatives, such as the Berlin process, regional reconciliation of youth, mini Schengen, and connectivity agenda. To make things worse, in 2020, uh, the EU has come up with a new sort of um, uh, plan for the accession of Western Balkans, which aims to reshuffle the negotiating chapters, enhance the role of member states, and introduce a new system for conditionality. 
However, this new policy is, is not likely to resolve the enlargement critique. In fact, greater, I, I would argue greater involvement of member states in the enlargement process um, risks turning the entire process into a geopolitical battlefield where member states tend to pursue their self-interest rather than the interest of the EU as a whole. So ultimately, as a consequence of this policy of never ending requests for reforms in the Balkans um, has brewed uh, sort of authoritarianism in the region uh, and uh, actually has sort of, you know, uh, led to a reversal uh, of progress and, and worsened uh, democratic reforms and civil society, uh, freedom of, of media and, and the rest. Um, so not, not only we see a fatigue of EU member states towards the Western Balkans, but we see actually now a new fatigue of member of Bal Western, Bal Western Balkans countries towards the EU as a whole. And that is manifested with the fact that some of the countries like Serbia uh, and others are actually looking at, for alternative arrangements with Russia, China, and, and other sort of, you know, uh, competing powers. Uh, so, so that's sort of, you know, EU's leverage and unique uh, possibility to impact on a region is, is weakened further. So let me conclude by um, sort, of, sort of saying that the fact that EU is continuing to ignore uh, the importance of a credible and uh, predictable enlargement process is uh, will deepen further, you know, its it sort of standing in the region and in the world. Uh, and only if the EU is able to kind of have a credible and sort of united front uh, is able to um, project its power in the region, but also resolve some historical conflicts uh, through peaceful transformation and reconciliation. Um, Yet it seems that the EU is actually not bothered by this uh, stalled enlargement process. And this is my final point. On the contrary, it seems that the EU is actually happy to have the Balkans as an oasis where um, it's surrounded by its own member states as a field of intervention, as a field where it exercises, performs its power. Um, and it's better to have sort of smaller problems like the Balkans rather than sort of have Russia or post Soviet countries as, as, as sort of, you know, frontline neighbors. Uh, in, in the Eastern, Eastern Front. Uh, so the e, if the EU wants to kind of, you know, uh, expand its strategic autonomy toward in relation to US and other global powers, it seems that it wants to deny that sort of strategic uh, autonomy to other countries in Western Balkans. And that sort of, you know, layers of, of, uh, of imposition, but also wanting greater autonomy for itself, it's really sort of, you know, uh, clearly uh, manifesting in Western Balkans. So I'll leave it here and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have a great conversation. Great. Thank you very, very much. I mean, it is true, as you say, that the British were some who really pushed enlargement. I mean, the idea of <coughs> Europe, Poland free was partly an American idea, NATO, EU. But, you know, leaving this hole in Europe leaves a huge space for other powers to play, and not just Russia and China, but Turkey also in Kosovo. So it really is a problem. And, you know, looking at the experience of Bulgaria, Romania, mm. it is true. The other countries seem in no rush to uh, move ahead. And that could be, in my view, pretty dangerous, mm. but we'll see. Um, I want to ask, Marta, who I know has to go soon, whether she has time to answer one question. Um, sure, or sure, sure. Okay. Maybe just to... I would like to, to listen to Javier. <laughs> okay, well, let's go right to Javier then. Yeah. I, I'd like to hear him too. Um, yeah. Javier Salana, as I hope everyone knows, is one of the great Europeans. I remember him as defense minister of a newly liberated Spain. Um, he would go to Rolling Stones concerts. Um, he, he was a marvelous Spanish diplomat. He was head of NATO at a very important point. And he really was the first real EU foreign minister, whatever we call it, in a much simpler and I think probably more efficient time. I mean, I, I spent time with him on his travels and in Brussels, and um, there are very few people who uh, I respect more for his vision of, of what Europe ought to be, could be. So, Javier, over to you with our thanks. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, and thank you very much for your kind words, exaggerated. 
and um, it's a pleasure to, to be with uh, some of you that I haven't seen for some time. Uh, again, uh, I enjoyed very much working with you, you know it. But let me, let me start by saying that uh, for me, uh, the Brexit was a very sad moment in the history of the European Union. And I like to repeat that, we no, 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 will not do it, but to keep uh, my sentiment is that a big, 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 uh, sad uh, experience never should have happened. And uh, for me, at least, was something inconceivable when I was uh, acting. Um, well, but we have to must uh, not dwell in the past and then and must uh, look at uh, uh, the new relationships and opportunities. Now, uh, one thing that I have to say is that uh, the fear that some members of the European Union had at that time, that the leaving of the uh, UK will, will be followed by several countries uh, put in their declaration for, for Brexit within their own country. Use of Brexit uh, from some countries from the eastern part of Europe uh, that were maybe thinking about that. But really the process, the learning how the difficulty of the process and the difficulty of, uh, of the, all the, the, the things that are related to somebody leaving a complicated structure that is linked to so many, so many fields that to, to, to try to cut all that is a, as difficult as you can imagine. So that is a good news that uh, nobody has followed follow that uh, decision that the uh, UK took. And as, as you know, and I know very well, it was uh, fear that uh, that may open that. The second thing that uh, I want to say is something very important for me on the negotiations. And it's the, the manner in which uh, the European Union defended the Good Friday Agreement. I think that uh, this is very important uh, to, to, to underline because we could have, uh, forgot about that. And I think to put the Good Friday Agreement and, uh, as one of the most important things of the, of the agreement, I think was very good for the United Kingdom. Um, so in a way, we did uh, the negotiation in very important parts with a lot of uh, kindness, if I may say that word, to the pot potential progress of the United Kingdom in the future. Now, let me, uh, say, having said that, uh, two things, let me move on to the, maybe is the time of, for the European Union to think seriously about uh, what we are. And uh, I, I have to recognize to you that I like the, the expression uh, strategic autonomy. And the expression strategic autonomy, uh, it was in my head a long time back. It was very difficult to put it on the first uh, in the first uh, security uh, document. But uh, if we define that properly, and we agreed on what is the content of that expression, I think that it would be a very useful instrument uh, to define and to harmonize all the foreign policy, security policy, technological policy of the European Union. I think that we, that we, we have to avoid and to prevent that uh, the, the word uh, terminology, strategic autonomy, it doesn't mean protectionism, it doesn't mean autarky, it doesn't mean unilateralism, and it doesn't mean also equidistance. So we'll continue to be uh, as close as we have been with the United States, and I would like to maintain a relationship with the United Kingdom within this framework as close as, as possible. So to have an, a definition of a strategic autonomy of an open definition, no, no uh, protectionist uh, definition, uh, does not mean unilateralism for the European Union, and to maintain the, the relationship with others, in particular with the United States and the United Kingdom, as solid as possible. Now, that means that uh, I'd I like to, to, to say that uh, the United Kingdom and the European Union must remain close allies. And uh, 
we have to begin to find already a win-win solution for the many, many problems that we are facing already. We are not going to have time to percolate everything in the, in the, in the agreement uh, of separation, but we may have to work together even without having the final, the final map uh, uh, completely finished. I think that in the European Union, uh, that is my, one of my experiences, is the European Union learns by action. Uh, with uh, with uh, Kim, I don't remember if I was with you, but with, uh, I think it was with you also. Imagine if we had a uh, wait to have all the matters relating to action outside our borders when we had found, or what would he finish that, we will still today without having deployed a single soldier to Bosnia or to the Balkans. So we learn by action. And I think we have to continue having action to solving problems. And that from there, go back to try to sometimes finish the scheme in which we want to work about. Now, two things that I'm going to say about our relationship with uh, the United States. And I would like also to be devoted to the, to the United Kingdom. I don't like very much uh, the, the, the terminology of summit of democracies. Uh, we tried time back, I remember with, uh, with Marilyn Allred, it didn't work. It's very difficult to do it. It's very difficult to find who is a democratic and who is not. Where do you do the line? What do you do together? I think it would be much better to create mechanisms to maintain people in the same, in the same sphere of, 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 of looking at the problems without having to create a sort of summit of, uh, of democracies, which I think will not fly. Uh, that is the experience I have. We try twice and, and, and never fail, and never, never fly. So watch out about, about that. I think that, uh, that uh, with the United Kingdom, uh, going back to the United Kingdom at the moment, I think we have to continue cooperating on security matters. I would like very much, Kim, uh, that we could uh, work as, in my time, we work with the intelligence of your country, the MI5, the MI6. It was, uh, with me, it was absolutely uh, very, very open. Uh, Probably I was the, the, the first and the last that he did this open in relationship with MI5 and MI6. But uh, do not get out of the, of the intelligence um, component of the members of the European Union. Maintain that uh, lines of communication open, not only with France and with Germany, but with others. It's very, very, very important. And it was very, very, very important. Now, the, Another thing that I want to say to, to, to the United Kingdom is that we think a lot about uh, our cooperation on security, and it's very important. But um, we have to cooperate on the future and the issues that are going to be together tomorrow, and tomorrow, which is today already. And I, I bring two examples to the table. Neither you nor us, we have the capacity of produce chips. The future is chips, and the future is molecules. If we have chips and molecules, it's going to be the, the, the terms of the, of, the, of the years ahead of us. And none of the two, in, in, in vaccines, you had a little bit better than we, but we had one of the vaccines, the chemistry or the physics, or the, the biology of the, of the vaccines on the and biotech, which is... Uh, uh, an important sophisticated vaccine, you have the classical from the, but we have to do much more of that. And we have much more on what I will call in general term chips. And without chips, uh, without having that technology in our sign, intelligence, artificial intelligence is not a real, a real, we could not be really in, 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 in artificial intelligence as important as we would like to, 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 to be. Now, the 
it is the last thing I would like to say is that we have to cooperate very closely on the international organizations. And I'm going to mention two. The WTO. The WTO needs a reform and in that uh, we have to cooperate. Uh, uh, we have to face that together with you and also together with the United States. But uh, that reform has to be a deep reform in the, because uh, so many things have, have changed in the matter uh, pertaining to trade that the reform in WTO is fundamental. And the, another reform which is fundamental is uh, the, the WHO. Um, we have been at a given moment with Trump uh, abandoned the, the Geneva WHO that the second most important financing was not in the state, it was, uh, it was Bill Gates. And that is something that uh, when I read, when I look at that, who was the second financier, it's, it's not uh, UK, it's not, it's not uh, it's, uh, China, it's not Germany, but it was Bill Gates. We have to really take more serious, seriously that organization. It needs change. Yes, it needs change. But it's absolutely necessary to have an organization which is dealing with global, global health which because we know that this is going to be with us for a long, long, long time. Um, I, 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 I don't want to say much more. One thing that has been mentioned is NATO. And uh, uh, I think it's been the king who has said uh, we will have to keep on uh, asking for more money. The Americans will continue to be asking for more money. I mean, with Trump, the debate has been very clear. Is not more money, which they want us to put into into NATO. Is to buy more America. And uh, when we enter into that debate, uh, we say, well, uh, we pay, we may put more money, but not necessarily buy in America. And this is uh, well, this is a problem that we have. We may have uh, mm. in the future also with our friends. Uh, with Biden. About Biden, I don't have more, nothing else to say that he said fantastic what he's doing. I didn't, uh, I really, for me, has been uh, fantastic the manner, the, the, the integrity of the team, the cooperation among the team. And uh, I hope very much that I can, uh, uh, with this uh, first me measurements that I've taken, uh, be enrich themselves so much that when the midterm elections do arrive, they will continue maintaining the Congress. That for me is the most important thing because climate change, it will depend so much on the nature of the Congress in the United States that, um, well, I finish here. Great. Gracias. Thanks very, very much. I mean, this is one of the issues that's on all of our minds, which is the midterms are, you know, about 18 months away, and um, which is why Biden is concentrating on domestic policy um, as, as much as possible. He talks about a foreign policy for the middle class. I don't know what that means, but that's what he says. Um, and he's gotten trapped a bit into a kind of vaccine nationalism because of it, though he he is now responding to um, criticism and um, trying to help. But you've raised wonderful points, Javier, about strategic autonomy, about which we could go on for, um, for quite a long time. I mean, one of your successors, um, your countryman, Mr. Borrell, seems to think strategic autonomy means anything from masks to vaccines. I'm not sure I would agree with that. Um, but um, what I would encourage, we have about 25 minutes left. We have some really smart people in the audience. Um, the questions, the easiest way to send questions, I think, as I understand the technique, is just send them in the chat to me so I can read them um, and then I can try to pass them on. And while that is happening, there is one question that came from Dennis McShane. Um, and and um, 
it was partly addressed to Marta, but I want to broaden it, which is, do you, do you all understand how much British politics has changed, basically? I mean, do you understand the, the drivers of it now? And do you believe, and this is what I would add and open this to anyone, um, that this British government is sincere about making the Northern Ireland Protocol work? Or do you believe in the end it's trying to undermine it? Um, because that is a key question, I think, given particularly we're speaking through DCU here. So I'd like to open that to our panel. Anyone who wants to respond, please do so. Kim, go ahead. Um, first of all, Steve, it's wonderful to hear from Dennis. Um, for whom many years ago, when he was uh, Minister for Europe, um, uh, I worked very closely with him. Actually, I should say I worked for him. Um, anyway, just on, I mean, a, a big area of subject he raised, just on British government's view on, uh, on the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, he wants to make it work and, and look, um, I think that in the end, this was, I mean, it was the only way that, um, I'm not making excuses for it, because I think it was a bad decision, but it was the only way that they could get Brexit done in a way which satisfied the hardliners who wanted this mythical, perfect, perfect sovereignty. And since we weren't going to put a hard border down, uh, down the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, um, there it is sitting in the um, middle of the Irish Sea. And they said, uh, alongside this, you've had some incompatible promises about, about free trading flows between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom, which were, as I say, frankly, incompatible with um, the decision that was, the deal that was done on withdrawal um, and putting Northern Ireland in a different category uh, from the rest of the United Kingdom. So this is the government that has managed to do two incompatible things and then is basically claiming that they are compatible and they're not. And that's why we're getting into the difficulties that we we're getting into. But underneath it all, I am sure that Boris Johnson is as keen to preserve the, the settlement and the peace that was achieved with the Good Friday Agreement as all of his predecessors. I don't think he understands, I don't think he accepted the advice that would certainly have been given to him that putting this, this, this trade border down the middle of the Irish Sea was going to upset the, the Protestant community in Northern Ireland and would cause you know, all sorts of tensions and problems to re-up. Then he accepted that advice and it turns out that he should have done because anyone who knows anything about Northern Ireland would know that this was the way it was likely to turn out. Um, so I don't think it's malign, I think it's just lack of attention to, to detail and uh, optimism that it wouldn't work out in the way that the pessimist said it was going to work out. And that's why we are, well, and this may sound a slightly haphazard way of making policy, but hey, look at how the government has performed across the board, Stephen, since it's been that's a um, And, you know, if it were not for the unquestioned triumph that was the vaccine task force and the vaccine program, they'd be in some trouble now. But that has been so pivotal a moment for the country, a moment of kind of national renewal, that a lot is being forgiven. Yes, no, no, it's true. I sometimes think, um, you know, things are accidental. Had uh, Theresa May done a little better in that ill-fated election and Arlene Foster not have had the power she had, yeah. one might have had a very different kind of Brexit. Yeah, um, I agree. So, so, I mean, these things happen, um, mm. but um, does, do others share this basic faith in the decency of Boris Johnson's <laughs> notion? <laughs> or, 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 or are there some who have doubts on our panel? Well, I, Eric, I, ha, ha, um, Javier, then Eric. Well, I, I, I I think that uh, if he does uh, take that route, he will have very difficult to maintain a solid relationship with the country, with the UK. 
this for us is an important, very, very important uh, issue, not only because of terrorism, et cetera, problems of that nature, but because of Islanders. Ireland will be a member of the European Union. And I think we put in the negotiation very clearly that that, as I said before, it was a, an important issue for us. And with that, I think we're helping. With being tough on that, I think in a way we're helping you also. Yes, and I mean, this is one thing Joe Biden does make it very explicit that he, that he cares about. I mean, it's not like he wears the Irish flag on his head, but it really matters to him quite a lot. Eric, go ahead. Yeah, Stephen, I, I, I think this gets back to the, to the essential element of trust. And the problem that, that makes Boris Johnson so difficult to trust is that we don't really know who Boris Johnson is. We know who he is as an individual, but the Conservative Party has evolved considerably since he was mayor of London. The support base for the Conservative Party has moved considerably. Uh, and, and we're not even sure how stable both the evolution and the movement really are. So it could change quite suddenly. And, and in that context, as important as Northern Ireland is, and it is vitally important, I don't think that it is a central concern in British politics. I think in British politics, the central concern is trying to figure out who is in the government, who is in the opposition, and how stable those coalitions can be made, even in the context of a parliament that looks set to last five years without a problem. Right. Good. Um, I have a good question. Um, well, there are bunches of good um, questions, but I'm going to pick one from John Pete from The Economist. And he says he'd like to hear more um, from others, also Kim, whether the how the UK can work with the other two E3 countries, but without working with the EU e e EAS on foreign policy. That seems to me a pretty central question. On Iran, it's pretty clear, but um, <clears throat> what do others think? Anyone? Well, I, I entered into that if you wish. Yes, please. No, I, okay, let, let's have a, a frank conversation. <clears throat> now, uh, the idea that uh, the contact group uh, was a good, uh, good thing was not accepted by everybody, but uh, it was accepted by me, which was very important that I accepted that, because it, it has to be, uh, it, it has to continue. And the difficulty now is what uh, we do with the United Kingdom. And do we take it in the contact group as the Europeans, or we wait until the United States comes in and then we call you back? Uh, this is a, 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 are you there from the very beginning at the difficult issues, or you have to, to, to wait until we get a, a common position, then we join you and then the, the, the United States? I think that uh, the contact group model is, uh, has to be maintained. Probably now that you are not in, Spain and Italy will have to have a, a more closeness to that, to that uh, scheme. But um, I think to maintain that type of uh, uh, geom uh, geometry, which is not, not legally, but uh, it has a good, uh, uh, very functional. Uh, that's what, uh, what I, I I mean, it's very strange that I say these things because I, but uh, I think it's, uh, it is very functional. But we haven't mentioned about, haven't mentioned China, but uh, I mean, they will be China, which are going to be very difficult. Um, but uh, I think that the Europeans plus the United Kingdom could do uh, some good in the manner that the United States did with China. I mean, the obsession of the United States today with China is excessive. And we don't have the same type of obsession with China. We, we could have a certain obsession, but not that much. I mean, now the United States is three things. Uh, the flag, Arlington Cemetery in China. Uh, <laughs> the China. These are the three things that get uh, the United States together. Don't we forget are, Putin. 
Putin, okay, well, but, but Putin is a complex, you know. Poor thing. For us, uh, Europeans, and I include you, uh, uh, Kim, uh, the, the, the way we handle China is, it will be very, very, very important. Well, let me ask him that, but also broaden it out to just ask, we're about to have a transition in Germany, right? I mean, Angela Merkel is leaving. She's already a lame duckling. Um, what Germany always seems to have these very dull politics, but of course it matters terribly. And if we're talking about the EU3, the position of Germany matters a great deal. I mean, Germany sits, you know, in a way as a balancer between Central Europe and everyone else. Um, and um, my question is, in a way, um, after Brexit, does Germany become more important? And are you worried about this vacuum of some new leader? We don't know who it's going to be, obviously. Maybe it's going to be Laschet, um, but certainly in a, in a coalition in which the Greens will play a role. Um, so, Kim, do you want to talk about that and anyone else? Um, very, um, very briefly, because a lot of people have views on this. I mean, just very quickly on, on the issue of, of how we conduct or coordinate on foreign policy issues post-Brexit. I mean, I agree with Javier. Um, the very simple way you do it, but it's very laborious and time consuming, is the Brits talk separately to the French and the Germans and the Spaniards and the Italians and the Americans, and we try and coordinate that way. It's obviously much better if you have some sort of structure, but it has to be informal. You can't do it like a G7 foreign ministers meeting, because once you start choosing people to be at the table, rather than the whole EU being at the table, then you get into all sorts of difficulties. So it's the sort of thing you do at senior official level rather than ministers meeting very visibly um, with some there and some not. But, um, but some sort of contact-like grouping. In the old days, when I first joined the Foreign Office a long time ago, there was a thing that was called in shorthand, in the British system anyway, the Quad, which was senior officials from the UK, France, Germany, and America meeting uh, every so often uh, to go through an agenda of international issues. Again, I'm not sure that's, that's right for nowadays, but, but something, some sort of informal structures which probably have to operate at official, official level are useful. Second point, very quickly, in developing whether it's on foreign policy or on trade issues between the UK and the EU or on cooperation over Schengen style issues or whatever, um, we need it and I think it would benefit the EU as well. Uh, that deal that we did on Christmas Eve was very minimalist. There are two inhibitions. On our side, the UK side, the inhibition is um, infringements of sovereignty. You want to sell your, your shellfish to the EU. Are you willing to let EU inspectors come and look at your shellfish farm? This kind of thing. Um, uh, are you going to waive your phytosanitary requirements? All that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, the Brexit wing uh, of Parliament was very happy with the minimalist deal done in... Um, uh, on, on, on Christmas Eve and if we start to go back away from that deal and allow as they would say the EU more into our, our national life into our businesses and whatever then there will be problems but that's our inhibition on the EU side the inhibition is that we can somehow negotiate our way to a position where we have the benefits of EU membership without the cost and the obligation which has always been understandable worry on that side mm -hmm. and that may also inhibit the EU from some of the things that might actually benefit um, the EU economy and, and cooperation with us. Um, on Germany, whoever wins in Germany, and I kind of feel this is going to be a change election, um, they will be critically um, important. And you can't basically have an effective policy on Russia or on China uh, or any of the other big international issues unless Germany is on board with it. Um, and as I say, my guess, I mean, you're closer to the Ryan Stephen, is that we're going to get a different, we might, you know, might get a rather different German government emerging from these elections. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to find ways of, um, of working with it. I mean, it's a hurry, but if it is a government that is more, the coalition government, obviously, but if it's more left wing in its inclinations, that's a bit, you know, it'll be further left wing than the Democrats are in the States, but it's, 
maybe that's part of a trend of the needle, the dial swinging back uh, towards the centre left and away from the right wing governments that have that have um, that have run uh, you know, big big countries in Europe and and, and the US for for um, you know, the last four years. This is part of what always fascinates me because you know. Merkel says all the right things about the transatlantic relationship and has policies that drive Washington crazy on China, on, on, on Nord Stream, which is not so strong on even Ukraine. While Macron annoys them by what he says, but his policies fit American interests perfectly. And it's to me, one of the great ironies, which goes to the heart of strategic autonomy. Javi, I'm sorry, you wanted to come in and I cut oh, you I, off. I, I just re remind you that uh, uh, Joska Fischer uh, was a foreign minister of, the, <laughs> of, the, of Germany mm. in a very, very difficult moment. The first green is then into the government and we have uh, problems of, uh, of seriousness <laughs> for them. Bosnia and Kosovo. And they handle it very properly, Joska. So I think that uh, the the Greens uh, are uh, when they can they, when they go to govern in this landers and the landers, uh, they are very very clear, and very solid, and everything. They are good. I think that uh, we shouldn't be very very negative vis-à-vis -vis the possibility of a coalition with uh, with the Greens. Mm -hmm. The, the, the one thing I think people are afraid of is a red, red, green coalition, but no, that isn't going to okay, good. I'll take your word on it. I, 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 I have a, a question from Ian Bond, which is related to, um, to um, what we're talking about. Um, he, von der Leyen spoke of a geopolitical commission, okay, but the EU obviously can't even agree to criticize what China is doing in Hong Kong, or not effectively. Um, so his, his, his thought is that Britain would certainly have blocked a move to uh, majority, you know, qualified ma uh, majority decision-making on these issues. But post-Brexit, is that now possible, do you think? I mean, this is the one thing everyone says would make European foreign policy more efficient, quality majority voting rather than unanimity. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to happen, but what do you think, any of you, post-Brexit? So, Stephen, the, right. the language that von der Leyen used in introducing this idea of the geopolitical commission is actually really interesting. Because the idea is not to have some big coherent EU that, that exercises influence on every major topic of concern, but rather to take foreign policy and to sow it much more deeply into all the instruments that the commission has to deploy. Uh, and, and to that extent, I think, <clears throat> I think there really is a big challenge with China because so many EU instruments are implicated in China that, that, that need to be somehow politicized, but, but it's very difficult to politicize those instruments, particularly when we're talking about trade or when we're talking about investment in ways that, that exercise the kind of leverage that von der Leyen anticipated. Uh, and, and so I think we're seeing an evolution here rather than, than a frustration. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's certainly true. I keep saying that Europe doesn't want to be co-pilot in the American jet fighter aimed at Beijing or aimed at Taiwan, um, but, it is a challenge to be sure. I mean, it's not just an ideological challenge. I mean, the Biden people like to put it that way, but it's a challenge to the export model um, because pretty soon the Chinese will be, I mean, the Germans are great at making 20th century stuff, but the Chinese will be making it themselves very, very soon. Um, and Germany doesn't seem to be understanding the risk it it faces, and if Germany, this big rich country, has these problems, economic growth could slow even further. That's part of the problem. We don't have tons of time, and I do want to get to a question from my friend Daniel Kalan, who, who I'm mispronouncing, of course, as I always would, but he asks about the future of mainly European military operations after 
after Brexit. Clearly, the EU potential capacity for these, he says, has been reduced. One answer has been Macron's intervention initiative, uh, which includes the, includes the UK if it wants to play. Another idea would be like a 5,000 member EU a force with um, members even including Ireland. Does, do either of these things make sense? Do they work? Is it still too early to think seriously about um, a real European military intervention force? Well, I, I, yeah. Him. Go. yeah, and no, Go I'll just brief, briefly, quiet. yeah, no, briefly on, I think we have seen, uh, silently, we have seen that sort of intervention force taking place, like France leading its own sort of EU operations, mm -hmm. but also within sort of UN platform as well as separately um, in, uh, in regions that have their own interests. Um, so certainly, uh, I think that would be a natural step and, and it, is, it is sort of foreseeable and, and viable option. Uh, but I, what I would uh, want to add here is the sort of the convergence between UK and France and Germany and EU member states is, is great in the scope of peacekeeping in the UN. And at the moment, they've lost the momentum, as, as, as some of the sort of uh, trends have shown, that China is actually taking over the industry of peacekeeping and peace building. Uh, so they've actually, you know, uh, silently are, uh, are expanding their normative, but also sort of operational control at the HQ and also in, in, in different missions. And that used to be a traditional field where Europeans had really sort of pushed um, international security, but also sort of values of liberal peace and, and the rest. And that is actually uh, is being taken by, by China. And the scope for sort of, you know, in EU operations abroad is, is there to kind of, you know, bring back uh, Europe within the UN peacekeeping operations and sort of, you know, reform the whole system in a way that uh, sort of retains um, the good elements of, of Western sort of involvement in these in these countries, or rather than just turn them into geopolitical sort of interventions that suits the interests of particular countries. Um, uh, because that's one of the fields where we have seen sort of, you know, global leadership. Uh, and, and that field is actually being taken by China silently that, that we don't really talk much about that. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else here? Because it, it it, it just feels to me that when we look at the European neighborhood, when we look at Northern Africa, when we look at worries about radicalism, terrorism, de desertification, um, one has to ask whether the EU is really prepared to take care of its own neighborhood, which is really the source of, of this, I guess, the source of that question. Anyone else on that? Kim? Um, just briefly, Stephen, um, two points. First, in terms of integrated EU military forces or EU military operations, I'm a skeptic. Um, uh, we had the Franco-German Brigade and I think they never deployed outside outside <laughs> Europe or... or you know, just ever a really outside serious, Strasbourg, serious, I don't think. Outside Strasbourg. I can easily imagine a European Council which comes up with with a concept of um, of a uh, you know, more integrated European defence um, structure, but I don't think in practice um, uh, it's likely to work or, or deliver anything very useful. And I do think it risks duplicating NATO. I mean, we've got NATO. Do we need this as well? Um, second point, though, um, I think you're absolutely right about the the pile up of problems around Europe's borders whether in North Africa or off um, in Ukraine and Georgia and places like that, um, or, or further afield. But I do think that the West has lost its nerve on interventions in the wake of Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, I just think you know, even if you had a structure, um, governments now, I mean, Joe Biden talks about ending all these uh, endless wars. Um, and, you know, if Biden, an internationalist, is saying that and is pulling all the American, all the troops out of Afghanistan, we'll come out of Afghanistan as well. Um, that, for me, is another signal that we have just, we no longer believe in the kind of interventions that we have done in the past as a solution to the injustices or abuses or problems we see around our borders. 
and you can't solve them from 30,000 feet. So if you're not going in on the ground, um, what is the future of, uh, of Europe or America as a force for good in the world solving problems? I'm kind of pessimistic about it, to be honest. It's a very good question, which is partly, do we really any longer believe in ourselves and in what we're selling? Um, that's the question Beijing and Moscow are putting out there. Mm. Um, and even Viktor Orban too. So these are, these are serious issues. Um, listen, we're out of time, which is very sad. Um, we've had great questions. I've been, I'm sure, not a, a very inefficient moderator for which I apologize. I, I would have loved to have gotten to more, but it has been an enormous pleasure to have this extraordinary panel and to see Javier, especially Marta, unfortunately, had to go sooner. Um, but thank you all for, for your patience and your attention. I will throw you back to Federico, I think, for a final word. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. Just to echo what you said, I also want to warmly thank all our speakers, uh, Javier, Kim, Eric, Gizim, and Marta that has left us. And of course, I want to thank you, Stephen, for masterfully leading uh, the conversation. Uh, it's been a fascinating debate. I wish we had indeed more time, but I suppose the good news to end with is that the Brexit Institute activities are continuing. Uh, we will have another event uh, in June and then one in July organized uh, in partnership with the uh, European Parliament and their uh, research service. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to stay uh, tuned. Uh, and it was really wonderful to see almost 80, 75 plus attendees. So despite uh, the fatigue with Zoom, uh, it's, uh, it's great. Uh, and I'm grateful that so many people decided to engage with us. So once again, uh, thanks for all your uh, support uh, and thanks to all our speakers for uh, their great energy and enthusiasm. And I wish everyone uh, a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye, Kim. Bye-bye, Javier. Great to see you. Thanks.